Good evening, everyone. My name is Douglas Sprang, and I lead the Energy and Environment Series for the MIT Club of Northern California. I'm delighted to kick off our second event of the 2022-23 season, featuring top speakers in the fields of renewable energy, electric vehicles, drought in California, and of course, climate change. Our speaker this evening is MIT's legendary Carrie Emanuel, Professor Emeritus of Atmospheric Sciences. Kerry is the author of the book, What We Know About Climate Change, which he presented to us back in 2014. The book was a straight up, plain English primer of sorts that covered the basics of climate change, including a few inconvenient truths. But times have changed and so has his presentation. His topic for this evening is climate change, opportunities and risks, with special emphasis on opportunities which will primarily address what we've learned since then and what we might now do about solving this existential problem. We have enabled live Q&A, and I'll do my best to get many of these questions to our moderator during the Q&A session after the presentation. Um, and we'll add these to the questions we got from online registration. We'd also like to suggest to you to put your um, Zoom videos, if you will, in gallery mode for viewing um, that's the best that we found um, uh, for this kind of an event. It's time for our program to begin. I'll be back at the end to close things out, but now I would like to introduce our moderator, Michael Carboy, who will orchestrate tonight's fireside chat. Michael is a highly experienced operating and finance executive who consults for companies around the globe to help them develop their decarbonization and sustainability strategies. So take it away, Michael. Thank you very much, Doug, and welcome everyone to the Energy and Environment Series. Um, tonight we'll be dealing with climate change with a focus on opportunities, but with you know a discussion of some of the risks rather than a than doom scrolling through environmental problems. Um, Carrie Emanuel will be with us this evening. Um, Carrie, may I bring you online, please? Welcome. Certainly. Thank you very very much. Uh, Kerry is um, someone who I look at his list of accomplishments and I can only be in awe of everything that this gentleman has accomplished in his years. Uh, from uh, serving as a professor and director in the Atmospheres, Oceans and Climates uh, uh, program at um, MIT, where he served as professor from 2009 through 2012. Uh, and then chaired the programs from, um, I beg your pardon, from 97 through 2012, and then chaired the programs from 2009 through 2012, and is uh, currently the co-director of the MIT Lorenz Center. So thank you very, very much, uh, Carrie, for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Um, yeah. uh, if I may, um, just in, you know, for introductory purposes, can I get you to tell us a little bit about what got you so interested back in the 70s? Uh, in climate science and atmospheric sciences and met meteorology and so on? Well, I was a weather weenie. I was fascinated by the weather. And uh, since I was a young child, but then in high school, I became very interested in physics and, and math and discovered very quickly you could put those together. In fact, atmospheric science is a very heavily mathematical uh, field. And so um, it was uh, all a straight, fairly straight path from there. I never really wavered from it. Oh, great, terrific. I uh, remember ages ago, uh, uh, an opportunity to take a class in the thermodynamics of weather, but unfortunately the gas dynamics elective took my interest. So um, in your journey, what other areas of science, economics, sociology have you drawn on to uniquely inform your view? and? What sort of unexpected or surprising insights have come from that sort of cross-fertilization? Well, I am very lucky to have been spent most of my uh, professional career at MIT, which is teeming with all kinds of interesting yeah. people in many different fields. But to answer your question, I would say that sort of in the field of energy and physics, the physics of energy, if you will, I've profited a lot from talking to people whose profession is mm -hmm. energy. And I'll be touching on that subject toward the end of my talk. Uh, but also um, I've interacted with politicians and got some very interesting insight. One of which is that when you talk to an intelligent person who says they, uh, they're completely in denial about climate change, 
they're really expressing a fear of what they might have to give up if people start taking it seriously. And that mm -hmm. turned out to be true uh, in my experience, and it's uh, helped me uh, be a bit more persuasive, I think. Yeah. Well, it all becomes the art of the possible rather yes. than the art <laughs> of the perfect. That's right. Um, so, you know, it, if you go back into the 70s when you were a weather weenie, um, you know, maybe the ideas of climate science weren't so rapidly moving, but nowadays they are no longer slow moving topics. Um, what areas within climate science or in cross domain related areas do you think are going to be likely places for significant opportunities, both in terms of improved understanding and um, sort of practice or commercial opportunity? No, oh, I think it's it's a field absolutely brimming with opportunities, both on the mm -hmm. side of, of uh, physical understanding of nature, uh, which is what I'm about, uh, and on the business end of it. Mm -hmm. And I would say that on the science side, we're really entering a period of very, very great transition from a routine estimate of, of natural hazard risks that are done, for example, by insurance company based strictly on historical statistics mm -hmm. to, uh, to physics-based risk assessment. Uh, and I think that's gonna be an exploding field and a very interesting one. I'm involved in it now myself. And on the business side, I think the opportunities, and this is something I wanna stress in my talk, are practically unlimited. I think, I think the nations that are clever and innovative are actually going to uh, profit from the transition. Um, and maybe man, many uh, nations will end up profiting. It's not, it's not all doom and gloom. There, there's something to look forward to there. Terrific, terrific. Well, I will put a cork in my mouth and turn the table over to you. So thank you very, very much. And we look forward to a great presentation. And we already have some terrific audience questions that have come in beforehand and are coming in right now. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you uh, both, uh, Doug and Michael. It's been a pleasure working with you so far. And uh, it's really great to be talking with all of you. I wish I could be there physically, but times are changing. Um, so let me uh, share my screen and uh, tell you a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I trust you can all see that and hear me okay. Um, so uh, some of you may have been around when, uh, as uh, Doug said, I gave a presentation on, on climate back in 2014, so eight years ago. And I'm not going to go over a lot of that ground tonight, so I'm sort of assuming you uh, know a little bit about that, and really start to focus on the risks and the opportunities, um, and I'll, I'll try to get through that. So I'm going to give you a very short update on the climate science. I'm not going to give you a climate science primer uh, tonight, but I can direct you to, to a few if you like. Um, focus a little bit on what turns out to be important uh, in this problem, which are climate risks. Um, and then the really interesting and I think somewhat new field of quantitatively trying to put numbers on these risks with, of course, uncertainty. And that, that risk is, of course, about uncertainty. Um, how, do we, how do we go about solving the problem? And I'm going to suggest to you that it is actually a very a, a nice opportunity for those wishing to seize it. So let me just start off with something that might be old hat to many of you, which is our influence on greenhouse gases. Um, I like this, the I like the fact that it goes back so far, and really, I think most of us attribute the idea that we could be altering the composition of the atmosphere in a substantial way to this Swedish chemist, Svante Arrhenius, uh, who lived from 1859 to 1927, and he actually did some very clever back of the envelope type calculations. He wouldn't have claimed that they were more than that based on measurements of the infrared radiation emitted by the moon. Um, and he came to the conclusion uh, that if you doubled carbon dioxide, you'd raise the Earth's surface temperature by about four degrees. You know, and if you think of the fact that um, a long time after he did that, uh, more than 100 years after he published that, um, you know, the all we've done really is to put error bars on his estimate. So the IPCC says somewhere between uh, two and four point five degrees, for example. So his estimate is 
is in the range of modern essays. It's a pretty spectacular accomplishment. And uh, you could ask, you know, he made a prediction in essence. Uh, was he right? And this is perhaps the most elementary test of that. It's a record of the global mean temperature relative to its average between uh, well, basically over the 20th century. That's the blue curve. It's every year since 1880 uh, up through 2021. And the red is, the, uh, is a scaled log rhythm of the carbon dioxide content. Okay, we know the radiative forcing of carbon dioxide goes uh, pretty nearly as its logarithm. So you can look at the those two curves. Basically, uh, of course, Arrhenius couldn't predict how fast CO2 would end up going up, but the temperature has pretty well tracked that. Of course, there's other things going on. It's not just carbon dioxide. Nobody doubts that. There's volcanic influences, there's solar influences, but just looking at those curves, you'd say, yeah, that's not such a bad prediction. So this is an old uh, prediction. It's, uh, this is not, the uh, climate science is not a very, very recent science as sometimes it's portrayed. Uh, let's put that carbon dioxide increase in the context of the last 800,000 years. Now, how do we know CO2 800,000 years ago and up to today? because of bubbles of the atmosphere that were trapped in ice as it formed in uh, the massive ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. So you take an ice core, you degas the bubbles from each layer, and you measure the gas contents. And they're not much more complicated than that. This blue curve is the record of CO2, 800,000 years. And you can quite plainly see the signal of the great ice ages has been about 10 glacial cycles in that interval. Actually, not quite 10. It's a little bit less than that. But, but the temperature actually drives a lot of the CO2 change, but the CO2 change is a feedback. In any case, that, that black spike at the far end of this curve is uh, today's value, OK? It's, it's up above the graph. So we did that delta function. And carbon dioxide is the most important long-lived greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, it is on very long time scales an, a thermostat and has uh, led to large swings in temperature over you know, tens of millions of years in the past. And we've just turned that dial way, way up. Uh, and that is hard to imagine that you can do that without incurring any risk. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. Now, of course, people try to make projections about carbon dioxide. Um, this is a record, uh, not 800,000 years long, but uh, only about 70 years long, but with projections going into the future. Um, the pre-industrial value was about 280 parts per million by volume. And uh, this blue horizontal dashed line is double the pre-industrial value. And these colored curves are various projections, which obviously depend upon one's projections about what we're going to do or not going to do about it. So the purple curve is, you know, we just, just go full throttle to the end of the century. It's a little unlikely we'll do that. If we did do that, we'd more than triple the carbon dioxide by the end of the century. And there are these other curves that are basically just educated guesses. Uh, there can't be much more than that. Now, one uh, problem about the biochemistry, biogeochemistry of carbon dioxide is it hangs around for a long time. So I'm showing you a chart here of recorded CO2 content up to now, and then assuming that it keeps rising at one of these projected curves until it gets to some concentration, then hypothetically, we just shut off the spigot uh, and uh, assume that there are no more emissions, suddenly no more emissions of carbon dioxide, what would happen in that case to the concentration of carbon dioxide? So each of these curves is a projection of what would happen to that um, if the spigot is shut off when you reach these values in PPA, uh, ppm, v, okay, all the way up to a maximum of 1200. What you can see is that there's initially a fairly rapid decay over a few hundred years but then it takes a very, very long time for nature to go back to pre-industrial, many thousands of years. So unless you figure out how to extract carbon dioxide artificially from the system, 
the decay time scale is very, very long. You know, whatever it does to climate, uh, it's going to be long lived. And in fact, the bottom graph here is the corresponding calculation of the global mean surface temperature corresponding to each of these CO2 curves. And to a good approximation, whatever temperature you had when you turned off a spigot is what you're going to have for quite a few thousand years. Why are these curves flatter than that? This is because of the um, slow migration of heat through the uh, depths of the world's oceans. So uh, that's, you know, we don't have a lot of time. If we want to do something about this, we don't have a lot of time. Unless we can figure out how to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere in some halfway economical way. Now, okay, so I want to now talk about what we in the field consider to be serious risks. Um, and uh, I'm going to give kind of a pre prelude to that by reminding you, I don't think I probably need to do this, that all estimates of risk uh, from your daily uh, calculations of how much insurance you think you should buy to almost everything else has inherently uncertainty. And climate projections are no different from that. We know that we aren't going to be doing a very good job with predicting something, even something relatively robust like the world's uh, global temperature. Uh, so we make uh, projections like this by running very large ensembles of models. And so what you're seeing here are estimates of the amount of warming that would occur as a result of doubling carbon dioxide. Um, and so this is just a probability distribution on the y-axis is probability and on the x-axis is the uh, is the degree of warming that results from doubling. And it's a very broad curve. 90% of the values lie between about 1.8 degrees and maybe four and a half degrees. But there are these other, these tails of the distribution and I'll come back to those. And so the vast majority of the predictions are sort of in the two to three degree range. And two to three degrees, at least uh, according to current science would be quite disruptive, but maybe you know this is something we could adapt to we're out here in this tail uh the risks are really start to get existential um so little risk substantial risk and out here we have catastrophic risk and we can't rule that out but it's low probability it's just not zero unfortunately so let's talk about risk a little bit more quantitatively if you uh, in any kind of industry that deals with risk, you've probably seen definition like that. The formal definition is it's the integral of the cost of something over its probability, All right? So it's actually a number that's usually measured in dollars or some currency. It's the cost over probability. And as a fun it's integrated as a function of the intensity of the hazard. And I'll come back and show you a graph of this. So the cost, uh, C of I, is a cost associated with a particular intensity, and this is just a change in prob the cumulative probability of the hazard between intensities I and I plus delta I. So what we're talking about isn't, isn't rocket science. If this is a probability curve of something happening as a function of its magnitude, and then this is the cost of that hazard as a function of its magnitude, we're integrating this cost curve over this probability distribution. And the problem is this tail, right? As Marty Weitzman, uh, economist at Harvard, like to point out, this tail can get very steep. And I'll tell you why it gets very steep. It's actually uh, an anthropological point. Uh, then you start getting a lot of contribution to the integral from the tail. To a first approximation, you don't really care about what happens to the peak of the probability distribution. And that's an elementary point that a lot of people miss. So they focus on that. What's the most probable outcome? It's the same mistake you make if you had to let a child run across a busy street, say, to catch a school bus. If you said, oh, well, there's a 60% chance she'd make it, right? Therefore, I should let her go. Well, we know that's bad reasoning because the cost to you of her being run over is extreme, right? Over on this end of the spectrum. So even 1% or even 0.1% probability you wouldn't let her run. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. Uncertainty, but if you broaden this probability distribution because you don't know the system, 
I think you can see that because you're broadening both tails, but especially this tail, you're increasing this estimate of risk. So we really would like to beat down the uncertainty. But while we have it, it, uh, it contributes to the risk. So, so what are the risks? Physically, what are they? I would argue that, you know, we climate scientists aren't really the best communicators of risk. And we focus on the things we think we can predict, like global mean temperature, right? It's looking for the keys under the lamppost. But I would argue that nobody really cares. I don't even care about what happens to the global mean temperature. What does it mean? I can get three to five degrees by moving from Maine to New York, okay? I, it, it's not gonna kill me. Uh, so why should we care about that? So what we really do care about in the end of the day are risks and uh, what sort of hazards or relatively rare events like heat waves, wildfires, hurricanes, hydrological things, drug droughts and floods. Um, if you talk to the DOD people, they're very, very worried about these last things uh, because they so strongly affect the supply of water and food. And uh, if you look at any kind of history of the world, you see that there are lots and lots of armed conflicts that have been driven by shortages of water and or food. They don't have to be caused by natural phenomena, but whenever you get into a problem, uh, uh, it, it really exacerbates the probability of war. And that's really where the existential threats come in. I would say, and a lot of economists say, well, the, what do we do about this? Well, we first would like to try to price these risks or somehow quantify them. Now, when they're existential, you can't quantify them. Uh, this, is, this is a great difficulty, again, that Marty Weitzman used to point out. But if uh, they're not quite that extreme, you can hope to quantify them. And of course, you have to take into account the uncertainty. And that's a prerequisite, although not a sufficient condition, to make intelligent choices. One instrument, but not the only one, uh, is insurance. Insurance is a way of pricing risk. Insurance companies spend most of their time trying to figure out how they should, uh, what kind of premiums they should charge. It's a very, very competitive industry. But today, they're using estimates of natural hazard risk that don't even account for the climate change that's already happened. And the reason is simple. They need 100 years of records. They can't use the last 10 years or even the last 20 years to get robust statistics. So they're not in a real bind here because they're aware of the fact that statistics they're using to price risk are, are dated. And this is a big, big problem that is receiving more and more attention, including at the level of the US president today. But science, the good news, I would argue, is science is positioned to make very rapid process, progress now in trying to quantify climate risk, even, right, uh, uh, though we're uncertain about predictions, but we can quantify that uncertainty to some extent, and that helps us quantify the risk. So why uh, is climate risk dominated by extreme events as opposed to sort of slow changes in something like global mean temperature? This is, this is a bit of anthropology here, which I don't profess to understand, but I'm fascinated by. And it, it starts with a couple of points, which I think should be obvious to everybody, right? Societies are usually well, and it doesn't matter what society you're talking about, as long as they've been around for a while, they're usually well adapted to frequent events. Now, what frequent turns out to mean, and we'll come back to that, is more than about once in 100 years. You know, a 40-knot wind in Boston isn't going to do much damage. It happens a few times a year. 60 knots is going to do a lot of damage, but not so much damage in Miami, because that happens uh, not so infrequently. And of course, the flip side is that societies are poorly adapted to rare events. So what happens is you get large increases in the cost of hazards if, event, if events that say were 150 year events become 50 year events. So there is kind of a universal curve that explains this, which I also find fascinating. If you look at all kinds of natural hazards, earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, hurricanes, and you make a graph of the percent of property destroyed this is looking at you know the his history of these 
events versus not the intensity of the event, but the return period, which is just the inverse annual probability of that intensity. So 100 years means literally a 1% per year probability. So whatever the hazard is, if it's an earthquake, this is in a particular place. Um, this is the expected return period. And uh, the curve tends to have its largest slope at around 100 years. So 100 is kind of a key number. Why? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect that it's, you know, four or five human generations, right? Yeah, if something terrible happened to your parents, they've told you about it. If it happened to your grandparents, you might have heard about it. If it happened to your great, great, great grandparents, you probably never heard about it. And that sort of spills over into the way societies develop. There's something about that. So we worry about events that are up here in the upper white quadrant migrating because of climate change to the lower continent. What happens down here is not consequential. And what happens way up here is not consequential either. It's right in this middle period. But let me give you a concrete example from my own work. This is an estimate of the uh, uh, damage that hurricanes hitting the United States do not to the whole country, but to a particular portfolio of insured property by a particular insurance company. We don't have to go into the details. And so on this axis is damage, and it's uh, it's on a log scale here. This is million dollars, 10 to the six. And this is the probability density associated with that damage. So the most probable event, most probable hurricane, if you will, uh, at any given time in any given year, is going to cost this company about a million bucks for this portfolio. Okay, the actual absolute number of value of these numbers doesn't matter that much. That's an this is an estimate for the climate of uh, 1984 to 2014. I'm not telling you how this is made. That's not quite the point of this. This is an estimate of the end of the century under a fairly liberal emission scenario. And you can see there's been a shift in that probability curve to higher damage because the storms are either more frequent or more intense or both, okay? It's not a really big looking shift on this graph. Now I'm gonna take the same numbers and do something a little bit different. These two blue curves are what you just saw. Uh, the red curves are taking that probability density and multiplying it by the damage itself. Now, so that's what is meant by this integral up here. But what you need to know about this is now the total long-term damage can be shown to be proportional to the area under these red curves. The solid curve is for 1984 to 2014. This curve is for the end of this century last 30 years. And you can see the area has gone up by more than a factor of three. And it didn't go up near the peak of the probability distribution for the event itself. It went up here in the tail of the probability distribution. So the things that are really contributing to the long-term damage are the, again, the relatively rare events. And it's a, it's a big, big increase from a relatively small shift in the probability distribution of the storms. Okay. So this is a little frightening to people who study natural hazard risks because almost all current risk assessments, whether they're by the military, by town planners, uh, by insurance companies, are based strictly on historical statistics, okay? And the problem with them is that they're not nearly long enough to give you a robust estimate of the 100-year storm. And they're not very good in most cases. They're very flawed and they're too short, as I've just said. And if you go outside North America, particularly to the developing countries, they're basically non-existent. But even if you had really good records, the last 50 to 150 years is a poor guide to the present, okay? Because of climate change that's already happened. I'm not talking about the future yet, just the present. Uh, most of us don't have a good quantitative grasp of current risk, never mind. And, and insurance companies in the last five years have massively woken up to this fact and are trying very hard to get grips on it and come up with another way of estimating risk that doesn't depend strictly on historical data. Um, the 
two big companies around the world that, that, uh, that model risk have been slow to migrate away from historically based to what I call a physics based approach, which I'm a very large enthusiastic uh, advocate of. I'm going to give you a concrete example because it comes from my uh, area of quantifying a particular risk, uh, which is hurricanes. So let's just talk about some broad numbers here. They have caused globally about, on average, 10,000 deaths per year since 1971, and uh, $700 billion uh, in damages uh, since 1971. The global population exposed to hurricane hazards has tripled in that period. Uh, that's amazing. I mean, the global population itself hasn't tripled. People all over the world are migrating toward coastlines. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting stuff behind that. But uh, they this has greatly increased their exposure to hurricanes just because they moved into places where they happen. Is the risk itself changing? Uh, because one thing you worry about is the confluence of this demographic trend with a real climate trend. Uh, it's, it's, we'll come back to that. Some people have tried to discern that from global damage. And here's an interesting graph showing the total uh, damage from tropical cyclone disasters. If you are interested in this stuff, that I've listed the database down here in the lower right, as a fraction of world domestic product. So this is normalized. It's, it's sort of an inflation-proof uh, number. And you can see that it's been going up very rapidly. It's 380% increase since 1970. But as we just mentioned, the population of areas that uh, are prone to tropical cyclones, TCs, has increased by 200%. So a lot of this is just demographics. But there might be an additional component due to climate change but it's very difficult to try, try to tease that out of a data set like this. Now, we do have records of hurricanes in the North Atlantic going back uh, reliably. It, it depends on who you ask, 50 years at most 100 years. And I'm just showing you the annual number of major hurricanes in the Atlantic in the historical database in blue from 1900 to about the present. It's been smooth with a seven year running average though. And um, major hurricanes are category threes, fours and fives, by the way. The red is a technique I'm gonna uh, briefly describe that we came up with at MIT, where we can take large scale climate data and make inferences about the number of major or any other category hurricane. That's the red curve. And the shading is a, an estimate of the sampling error from the historical data. The fact that there are just very few storms means that just random variability is going to give you a lot of fluctuations that they agree kind of well. So we think there's been an interesting uptick with a very prominent hurricane drought in the 60s through 80s, which we think we understand. It's another man-made phenomenon, by the way. It's not greenhouse gases. It's something else. That's a very interesting story. Globally, this is just the number of storms on the planet going back to the beginning of where we think we have reliable estimates. It's There's no trend in that. It's just sort of like a random Poisson process averaging about 90 per year. Uh, but as was predicted uh, in 1987, that we should see a greater number of the more intense hurricanes. This is an analysis by my colleague, Jim Cawson, University of Wisconsin from satellite data showing the proportion of hurricanes that reach major hurricane status has been going upward. And this was uh, kind of verified a theoretical prediction. But the historical database is vastly insufficient for quantitative evaluation of current risk or trends in risk. This is a big problem for people who want to deal with this particular hazard. How do you do it right? I would ask, I would argue that you need to bring physics to bear in particular models. Models have gotten quite good. Um, of course, all forecasts that we listen to beyond six hours are based upon a, a algorithm that that uh, solves the equations that govern the behavior of fluids and radiative transfer and so forth. And here is a satellite image a real satellite image. And here is a weather prediction from one of these global models. 
it's getting harder and harder to tell uh, the modeled uh, reality apart from actual reality. It's getting better. Quantitatively, um, we can see this. This is a particular measure of the skill of numerical weather forecasts. The blue are 24-hour forecasts. Sorry, they're three-day forecasts. The red is five, the green is seven, and the yellow is 10. This is from 1981 to 2018. The uh, difference in these curves is just northern hemisphere versus southern hemisphere. It's just a measure of the skill, the forecast versus what actually happened. Uh, obviously, the shorter term forecasts are more skillful, but these things have been trending upward in a very gratifying way so that you can say that a seven-day forecast today has about the same skill level as a three-day forecast had in 1980. So this is a huge scientific success story, not very often told, but uh, weather forecasts by numerical computation solving the actual equations have gotten steadily better. Well, if we come back to hurricanes, the problem with these models is they uh, are too coarse. Their computational message, uh, meshes are still too coarse to really get hurricanes. And this chart just shows that. This is uh, just the probability distribution of storms by their lifetime maximum wind speed in meters per second. So the more intense storms to the right. This black thin vertical line is the boundary between category two and three here. Um, and uh, you can, the black is observed. You have a small, but these are the important ones, a small number of very high intensity storms. The model, even a state of the art model doesn't get any of them. Okay, it only it simulates weak storms. So we really can't use global models yet to do this problem. And, and um, we, uh, I, I'm not going to really tell you much about this technique tonight, but we, over the last 15 years, developed a really good technique for doing something called downscaling, which basically means we're embedding a very, very high resolution specialized model of hurricanes inside this global time evolving model. And we can easily generate 100,000 storms that way. Long story. Um, and we can look at particular regions. So these are storms all filtered to pass within 150 kilometers of downtown Boston. And I'm showing you only the top 50 of, a, of an event, a modest event set of 5,000 storms. And so you can generate enough of these. And of course, you wouldn't trust it unless they compare well to historical statistics. And that's, that's a long story. It's just as easy to downscale a climate model as it is a climate analysis. And here is, for example, an estimate of the frequency of storms in Boston that produce wind speeds greater than the number on this bottom axis. Um, and this is based on four uh, downscaling four different climate models for the late 20th century in blue and the late 21st century in red. The dots and the lines are the multi-model mean, and the shading is uh, a measure of scatter among the models. So when you go into the future, there's very large uncertainty, particularly at the high intensity end. So for example, 64 miles per hour, which is nominal hurricane strength uh, in today's climate might happen within 150 kilometers of Boston every 18 years, at the end of the 20th century, down to every six years at the end of the 21st, 100 miles an hour, which would practically never happen, might happen once a century. We can do this kind of analysis. Um, we can also use these hurricanes to drive hydrodynamic surge models. Um, surge does most of the damage in most hurricanes. It's all, it's all water. We think about them as windstorms, but it's really water about water, both fresh and salt. And uh, so this is the annual frequency of uh, storm surges of the magnitude you see on the bottom axis. Again, same kind of curve, 20th century, 21st century. So for example, uh, you would get two meter surge in Boston Harbor every 1600 years, which is, for all practical purposes is never, okay. But because of sea level rise and changes in storms, it would happen quite frequently by the end of the century. So we're worried about that. 
you know, at that high end, you could imagine a, a picture, an aerial picture of Back Bay, Boston, and Cambridge. This building here is where I used to work uh, under a lot of water. So this is the kind of thing we worry about are these tail risks. Okay, so that's a once over lightly on risk with an example. What are we going to do about this? So I put up something a bit naive, but I think more or less true because this is how we deal with most risks. First of all, you have to assess the risk quantitatively. You know, how much is the risk? How much does it cost? Once you know the event frequency, if you have the right data, you can make an estimate of the economic costs or economic risks that that hazard poses. And that can serve as a basis to formulate policies to address the risk, because you don't want to spend much more uh, through policies than the risks are worth. And you have to account for uncertainty at each step in this process. This is just traditionally how we estimate risk. And that's been done for climate change by a whole bunch of different folks and groups. And um, as summarized by this nice paper by Solomon Siang back in uh, 2017. So this is global mean change in temperature. And uh, the modeling accounted for all the different kinds of risk, floods, heat waves, fires, hurricanes, you name it. There are large ranges of estimate. And what uh, you have on the y-axis is the uh, how much it will cost, in, in uh, this is for the US, by the way, in terms of percentage of the gross domestic pro, uh, product by the end of the century. So you can see this is a, not surprising, a fairly nonlinear curve. If we have a temperature, global temperature change in the range of two to three degrees, it's about a 2% hit to the GDP. Now, Steve Coonan and others go around saying, huh, it's only 2%. So why should we worry about it? Uh, that's not very good economics. So let's look at US GDP, 1900 to 2017. Uh, this is the curve, this ochre curve. Um, and um, you can see this big deviations that occurred in the Great Depression and World War II. And at its peak, the Depression caused a 3.3% drop in GDP relative to what presumably it would have done. Um, but averaged over the period of the Depression is more like 1.5% or so. So I have to emphasize that the loss of GDP is not for a single year, it's sustained over many years, not just 10 or 15 years of the Great Depression. So this, uh, by historical standards, would be pretty disastrous to the economy if it happened. Um, I might add that at the peak of the uh, war effort, World War II, the US was spending 40% of its GDP on that. So, I mean, there's this kind of interesting stuff. So the main message I want to convey to you tonight um, is this one. And that's probably the most important thing that I will have said. And that is, it's maybe obvious to you, where there's risk, there's opportunity. I realize that sounds a bit Machiavellian, and it's not meant to. But opportunity, when people perceive an opportunity in solving or addressing this risk, things, I think, will begin to change more quickly. Well, let's start with some interesting, let's start with energy. Okay, so the global annual energy market today is about $8 trillion, okay? Um, large expected growth in demand from the developing world, principally India, China, and uh, equatorial Africa. So this, is, um, this number can only go up unless something really awful happens. The fact of the matter is energy is being decarbonized, but very slowly at this point. Uh, I would argue rather trivially that nations and industries and maybe even individuals that innov innovate clean energy will become market leaders and actually stand to profit from the transition. And because of the, the ticking clock and the fact that we don't yet know how to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere economically, it would be a good time to try to catalyze energy innovation. Now, I'm a climate scientist, and I'm not an economist, and I don't have my favorite energy sources, and I, I don't have strong ideologies about either free markets or control markets, 
I think because of my MIT background, I'm a pragmatist, what works, okay? And we know from the past that sometimes it's uh, really good if the government can help catalyze innovation that probably would occur anyway, but help it occur a bit faster. So what are the solutions in the field of energy? How are we going to handle this big increase in expected energy consumption, particularly if we electrify uh, a lot of things that aren't electrified? How are we going to do that uh, and meet this growing demand? Well, one thing that's widely discussed is renewables. The good news is, as you're all aware, that the raw price of photovoltaics and wind turbines are dropping and have been dropping very rapidly. This was catalyzed, at least in many countries, by government intervention. It would have happened anyway, but it happened sooner. Now, the problem is that uh, at low market penetration, well, the virtue is, I say, low market penetration, the fact that these sources are intermittent has been dealt with uh, through the provision of base load on a on a grid, most it's mostly coal and natural gas today, uh, and it, on the grid scale, because you can go for periods of time with no sun and no wind, you have to maintain at least the full capacity of base load. It's not running at full capacity, but you have to have that capacity. There are maintenance costs associated with that. But if you go to high market penetration, and this is something that is not often uh, publicized, uh, you have to rely on storage. Uh, you, you, know, you have to get through the night or through the period of low winds. And the problem is the storage costs, although they're dropping, haven't dropped anything like as fast as the raw PV costs. If we take the best current and near-term projected storage method, maybe not long-term, but near-term, lithium-ion batteries, 12 hours storage capacity, about $4,000 per kilowatt hours projected for the year 2025. So that would mean that to meet the demand, we, of, by 2040, we'll need 5 trillion watts of capacity globally. That would cost, if we were to do it all by renewables, $1 trillion a year for 20 years. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story, because if we were still, and I hope we wouldn't be, but if we were still relying on lithium ion batteries, the current lifetime is only a decade or so. So you have to add another two trillion a year in maintenance costs. And that only buys you 12 hours. This is the downside of renewables. People who are energy experts, of course, are very familiar with this, but it's not, it sort of falls on deaf ears among the public. Another uh, possibility is nuclear fission. Um, the projected electricity demand would be the equivalent output of about 25, this is globally, 2,500 two gigawatt reactors. And you'd have to build 125 of them per year for 20 years. It's pretty daunting. Um, the current cost to build one in South Korea, where they're relatively economically built, is about $4 billion. So you'd have to be spending about $500 billion per year for 20 years, about 6.6% of current world domestic product. The nice thing about the nuclear is it has a long service life. It's around 80 years. And the other thing that people don't recognize is we actually did build reactors at this rate, although scaled down to the level of Sweden, uh, which in the 1970s and 80s, driven by a desire for energy security, climate really wasn't on the radar, built about one four gigawatt reactor per 10 million residents per year, which if you scale it up, I'm not saying you could, would be 750 reactors per year, whereas you don't need that many. The fact is, is that several different countries ramped up nuclear fission very, very quickly in about a dozen years back in the 70s and 80s. But we can do better with this uh, molten salt reactors, which are passively much safer, can help process some of them, can help process waste from light water reactors. Some of them can operate at ambient pressure, run on thorium, which is more plentiful than uranium and is less suitable for weapons. And, so on. Uh, the, in my view, the safety of nuclear power simply should never be on the table as an issue. Uh, it, it seems incredible to me that it is. This is just the number uh, 
it's a hundred it's a more it's not a very nice graph to show hundred thousand deaths per trillion kilowatt hours by source and nuclear is at the bottom um 13,000 premature deaths annually in the U.S. from coal production and combustion, 8.7 million globally, which means that more people die. This is something that really knocks my socks off. More people die every three days from fossil fuel particulates. This is just um, respiratory problems. It's not climate. Um, every three days that have died in the whole history of nuclear power. Um, and yet we consider nuclear power to be dangerous. It's, I just don't understand that. Um, there are also non-climate non savings from the elimination of fossil fuels, no matter how you do that elimination. If we take the more conservative World Health Organization 4.2, a mere 4.2 billion premature deaths from fossil fuel particulate pollution. Imagine that we said that about any other energy source. If I said that nuclear power killed 400,000 people or 4,000 people, you demand that it be shut down, but we tolerate this, okay? I don't get that. If we wanna put a price on it, I don't know how to do that. The economists say the economic value of life globally mean in an average sense, it's $100,000. I don't know where they get that number. If that's true, we would be saving $400 billion per year just by shutting down fossil fuels if we could replace it with something uh, economical and clean. And if we want to apply that to nuclear power, it brings the net cost down to $100 billion per year, or about 0.1% of world domestic product. Um, Adding cheap green energy, no matter how it's green, would permit large increases if it's cheap enough in per capita wealth in the developing world, which by the way, this I didn't put this as a bullet point, is a key historically to driving down population growth. If you make people richer, they have fewer children for whatever reason. And the population growth is a big driver of emissions. So one of the things you don't want to do is increase poverty because that will in the long run increase emissions. Um, this energy conversion would probably be a net benefit even before we talk about climate change. Now, if we want to compare that to the cost of doing nothing, we rely on more on certain projections, but the intelligence unit of The Economist magazine says that if we don't do much, it's going to cost us about $3 trillion a year by the end of the century. Let me wrap up now so that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, with the main points. Uh, we're altering the composition of our atmosphere. There's zero doubt about this in the scientific community, and I really do mean zero. And it is at, I would say, this is more subjective, but a lot of people agree, considerable risk to ourselves and future generations. What does considerable mean? Well, you could, could say non-negligible if you prefer. There is risk incurred in doing this. Now, we're not, we're only beginning to be able to quantify that but it's clear that it's not trivial. The long-term risk is dominated by extreme events. Um, historical records are not adequate for estimating these extreme events probability and um, for either the current uh, climate or future. Um, we have simply got to get away from reliance on historical statistics and uh, estimating natural hazard risks. And that would be true even if the climate stopped changing. In fact, it would be true uh, if the climate had been stable all along, simply because the records are too short for a robust estimate of these risks. Uh, and I would say, given the estimates of what climate change will cost, that the risk to the economy warrant spending at least 2% of world domestic product on mitigation. And that's without paying a risk premium. That is, if we were insuring our house, instead of the world, uh, this we would do this routinely, okay? Um, the good news is that, and this comes more from energy experts at MIT than from me, but um, using optimal combinations of nuclear power renewables, and I've stayed away from sky, you know, pie in the sky, potential sources of energy, just what we've got now to work with 
uh, some combination of nuclear power renewables, it's probably feasible to decarbonize electricity at about half a percent of world domestic uh, product. And though I don't me didn't mention it, uh, the other source of it, other kinds of energy we need, like high temperature heat for certain industrial processes, if you throw all that in, <laughs> it's about 2% of world domestic product. So yeah, we're incurring a risk. We have the means to mitigate it. And the nations and industries that, that that begin to do this effectively are probably going to profit very nicely from the transition. I'll leave you with, with those thoughts. Thank you. That is a fascinating presentation, Carrie. Thank you very, very much. The audience has bombarded us with questions. We've got uh, at least 30 questions here and we won't be able to get to all of them. So um, I forgive me for picking and choosing to the audience. I apologize. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, we've, we've made things warmer in the past 200 odd years. You know, how do we turn the temperature down? Can we? Well, there, there are two different ways you could turn the temperature down. Uh, the, the most straightforward and least risky is to take the carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And I didn't talk about this. We do know how to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere chemically. It's just way, way too expensive right, right now. Uh, we yeah. just couldn't do it at scale. Yeah. Now, um, absolutely worth looking into the technology. Yeah. Sorry. Is there an optimal temperature? For the Earth, how would we think about an optimal? Yeah, point? there is an optimal, and there's an easy way to think about it. Human beings on the time scale of hundreds to thousands of years are very adaptable, mm -hmm. and our civilization, if you re read texts on this, go back six or se seven thousand years. The human civilization. That's an interesting number because seven thousand years is when the climate equilibrated after the end of the last ice age. So we've had a very stable climate for the last 7,000 years. And we have become very, very finely acclimated to that climate. Mm -hmm. And if you change it, it doesn't matter if you make it warmer or colder, if you go away from that, it's gonna be disruptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Um, the, so we, we've, we can look at the IPCC data and the various uh, ensemble forecasts, and we can talk about 2C, 2.5C, 3C excursions by 2050 or 2100. Um, realistically speaking, given the trends that we see in place now around the world, uh, both for throttling down emissions control, um, uh, emissions rates, as well as possible ways to start sequestering carbon through agriculture and land use means, where do you think we really come out by 2050, we up three degrees, up, up two. Well, I sort of feel like going back to my little girl crossing the street analogy. And it's like a bunch of bystanders who don't particularly care about the little girl taking bets on whether the chance that she's gonna run be run over is 5%, 3% or 1% or 50% yep. or just taking bets on whether she'll make it. What we should be doing is paying attention to the probability distribution of the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. If there's a 2% or 1% existential threat to civilization, that needs to be accounted for. And, and what the mean is doing is a somewhat less relevant. Now, of course, the two are related. What the mean's doing and what the wings are doing are not unrelated but we have to pay attention to those wings. And so I don't think it really matters that much whether the mean temperature is two degrees warmer or three degrees warmer when it comes to looking at this in a risk framework. It's the wings that have the teeth. It's the wings with yeah. the teeth, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, one uh, question that came in during the, the presentation uh, sort of gets at this topic of, uh, you know, different parts of the world are warming at different rates. Uh, the Middle East is starting to experience some tremendous uh, high temperature excursions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there are parts of the Middle East where it's really going to become very difficult to be outside by in, in 2050 or 2100. Um, how is the, as we get an average change in global temperature, what, how does that distribution of 
those high temperature excursions change? Is there any rule of thumb or quantifiable way that we've examined um, that those forecasts? Yeah, because it's actually a much more interesting question than it might seem at the outside. I mean, it's already an interesting question, but mm -hmm. you want to know things, again, coming back to my emphasis on extremes, uh, how intense will heat waves be? How long will they last mm -hmm. in various places? And when we're talking about heat, by the way, it's not just temperature, although that's the way journalists talk about it. It's a combination of temperature and humidity. We call it the wet bulb temperature. Mm -hmm. Some people might know what that is. That's what we feel. And that's what we biologically respond to. That actually goes up just as fast in the tropics as it does at the poles, um, pretty much. So, but what we're worried about, again, is not the mean, it's what happens to these extremes, the, the length, intensity, duration, geographical distribution of mm -hmm. heat waves, among other things. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the temperature excursion crises versus flooding or water availability crises will likely drive more uh, social unrest or, or more migration activity? Oh, that's a really interesting question, and it's a tough one for me. Uh, I know that um, the, the Defense Department, for example, mm -hmm. that takes these things very seriously is worried about both and fires. Mm -hmm. uh, fires are very dislocating and can be extremely disruptive, as we've seen. So it's hard to, you know, a lot of these extremes are changing, and um, it's hard to predict which one's going to dominate or whether they're all going to be contributing in a substantial yeah. way. Uh, but water is a big deal. Too much or too little has historically been, you know, capable of changing civilization. So I would worry about those. The the similarly on the food topic, I know agri food is may not be your 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 forte, but I'm curious whether you have any thoughts on the the impact um, are we seeing the same magnitude of impact for a degree of temperature variability volatility um, in the food stocks that we might see for for water drought too much water too little water uh, or too hot a temperature for people to exist well of course they're closely related because crops are very sensitive to temperature and water uh, um, the the factors that you have to account for of course is that uh, you can change the kind of crop you're growing, or if you want to look at it differently, the kind of crop you're growing can can move forward uh, sometimes if the soil permits it to a cooler climate. Um, I'm not enough of an expert to feel comfortable answering that question, but it's a it's a very important one. Yeah. Well, I think we both you know started our our lives uh, around the time that the notion was nuclear would be too cheap to meter right yeah. for our for our homes and. It costs became issues, um, and as you've said, we've rightly have this unreasonable health scare over nuclear. Uh, it could provide, if I understand your remarks, it can provide um, a very appealing alternative to fossil fuel baseload. Uh, but can you speak a little bit about the um, residual risks that might be associated with the whole fuel reprocessing and nuclear waste cycle yeah. that might come from that? And the, the, the carbon burden associated with that. I, I think that the most serious risk by far is the nuclear proliferation risk, somebody getting hold of nuclear material. And that has to be taken seriously. The waste is a political and social problem. It's not a technical issue. We've known for a long time what to do with waste. You bury it in stable bedrock, as they're doing <laughs> in Finland, beginning to do in Finland. It's just there's such a gap between the risks that are assessed by people who are good at assessing and, and the risks perceived by the public. Yeah. But if you really want to focus on the real risk, it's proliferation. Now, what can you do about that? Well, the migration to thorium will not eliminate that, but reduce it a lot just because it's harder, right? To, mm -hmm. to you're, you're talking about something that's uh, uh, fertile, but not um, visible, I think is the word. I've, I've forgotten. It exactly. doesn't have a massive fast yeah. neutron. Process. Yeah, that's right. And, and of course, you can develop reactors that, to process the waste, at least. Uh, so there are measures that can be taken. I think what I'm trying to do is 
not claim to be a nuclear expert, but to plea uh, with people to take a rational approach to it. If you just look at the risk of one energy source in isolation, right, you can do that. But what you have to do rationally is comparative risks. What are the risks of nuclear versus gas, oil? We already talked about particulates. Even solar. I mean, we talk about nuclear race. Solar PV is full of, um, of rare earths, uh, rare metals, uh, some of which, like cadmium, are extremely toxic. And today, you know, wind up in landfills. It's like, this is a, you know, this is a, a real problem. So we have to weigh all those risks. And we have to weigh them against the costs of inaction, right, with respect to the climate. So it's a complicated calculation. Mm -hmm. But what we have is we have advocates for this energy source or that energy source all arguing their cases or why the other guy's energy source is risky without talking about the risks of their own. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a complicated calculation. There's going to be subjectivity into it. I just don't think we can afford to take nuclear off the table. For sure. No, I think that's a, a good point. Um, the we've talked a lot about the models having gotten better. Um, are there any models that integrate the impact of solar changes and solar variation on the magnetosphere, and then the impact on a magnetosphere to storm intensity and lightning frequency? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's zero impact of what happens in the magnetosphere on weather, okay? Lightning, maybe, but lightning isn't really important uh, for, for climate. Um, but, so of course, solar variability by itself, the electromagnetic part of solar variability is very important for uh, climate. And um, unfortunately, good measurements of uh, solar output are only available back 40 years maximum, and that's because of you can only do that from Earth orbiting from satellites. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have proxies for solar activity going back much further in time, which are very interesting itself. So the solar is a player in climate, uh, and orbital variations on the time scale of tens of thousand years for sure are very, very important drivers of climate change. Uh, so it's not a question of this is the cause or that of because they're all causing climate change, but on dramatically different time scales. Mm, okay. uh, so the problem for us is that we are doing something to change climate on a time scale, which is too fast for a comfortable adaptation on our part. Let me use that point as a jumping off point for one of the questions that came in uh, before the event. And this gets at the idea of various geoengineering solutions, whether it's atmospheric engineering or ocean engineering. You know, do you think that these are, are viable tools that we should be exploring? Uh, are the risks of uh, a misfire that we can't manage um, too great? Um, or is this a way that we can control the amount of energy that's coming down into our troposphere and into the, 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 the oceans? Uh, in a safe way. Well, so the the story there is that the the kind that's immediately doable, which is solar radiation management, where you put material in the stratosphere uh, to block sunlight. Uh, we could start doing that today if we wanted to, um, and we have had nature do the experiment for us, kind of in the form volcanoes. of large volcanic yeah. eruptions, which do the same thing. And they do cool the climate. Uh, the problem, there are a couple of problems. One is you're trying to correct for a man-made effect, which is operating in the infrared part of the spectrum. It's a greenhouse effect with an effect that's operating on the solar part of the spectrum. And the reason that makes a difference is that, uh, for example, um, the water vapor cycle responds very differently to those two things. So if you could dial the temperature back if you needed to to pre-industrial levels, you would wind up with far less rainfall than you had in pre-industrial times. Oh, interesting. So you can't make it a zero sum across all the quantities that are that you would, might want to do that. The other problem is a practical problem, uh, and it is the fact that uh, it's very likely that if a nation started to do this, or even if it was a global collaborative, uh, that weather events would start to be blamed on uh, yeah. this. 
uh, whether or not there's any scientific basis for that. Uh, you're going to have lots of lawsuits flying around and the potential for conflict between nations if one nation thinks it's being deprived of reign by what the other country is doing. So it'd be kind of a political and legal mess. The other final drawback is that if it's solar radiation management, the problem is it's not addressing the root problem, which which is the increase of carbon dioxide. So if you ever shut it off, for mm -hmm. whatever reason, uh, you know, you got yeah. bombed and your right. source of the, whatever material is shut off, you would have a really bad problem in a hurry because the sulfur would go away in about two years, which is very mm -hmm. fast. And all of a sudden you are gonna have this huge radiative forcing. So wow. that's another drawback of that approach. All right, so it's better to address the Better to reduce the carbon inventory already in the environment, or to and to reduce the rate at which we're putting into it, rather than try and put sun put sunglasses on. Yeah, and you know we should try to innovate our way out of it one way or the other. But the clean way to do it is to either stop putting carbon in or figure out how to take it out. So we have multiple pathways to reduce carbon emissions, and you've mm -hmm. talked about sort of the a sensible pragmatic. Um, approach, one that is based in rational economics. Um, does this require for, for businesses and governments to genuinely engage um, in efforts to reduce emissions, does it require a price on carbon? I don't care whether it's cap and trade or carbon tax. Do we just sooner or later have to get there to drive the right economic incentives? I think the question in my mind, if I slightly phrase what you asked, is will a carbon tax make it happen faster? Okay. I, I would say two things. I don't think a carbon tax will make something happen that wouldn't happen anyway eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can you make it happen sooner? And can you do that in a way that makes economic and climate sense? And I'm not enough of an economist to know that. Uh, but I do think governments can do different things to and have done historically to, to help accelerate a market change that would happen probably anyway, right? Okay. And it could be just by uh, subsidizing innovation, putting money into innovation. That's kind of a no-brainer at some level. We want to do that. Yeah, uh, I think it, it, I, I don't it, know whether the carbon tax would have that effect, but one would hope so anyway. It's that balancing act between time. We don't have a lot of time. So do we want to wait for the for natural economic forces to slowly shift attitudes or do we want to sort of stimulate? Because you, you had talked about the possible use of national policy as a way to spur things along. Yeah, I mean, that's right. And it's a way for particular countries or industries to get ahead in this whole transition. Yeah. yeah. Um, hydrogen. Channel, we haven't, haven't touched much on hydrogen as a, a possible um, fuel source or as a uh, industrial process chemical to decarbonize industry. Um, so long as it's produced with solar power or wind power and it's it's green or, or even turquoise, um, might that be a interesting path for people to go down as opposed to gray carbon or other um, methods that might uh, reform? So, I mean, my attitude, I'm, I'm not an expert on hydrogen. I know that it's, a, it's an interesting sort of st a storage uh, vehicle, if you will, mm -hmm. among other things. Um, I think it's too early to call the race, right? Um, I'm not sure we should bet on any one horse at this point, but we should be underwriting all the ones that look like they have a decent chance. And no doubt we'll be in, we'll end up with a mixture anyway. So yes, hydrogen, uh, yes to better batteries, yes to nuclear, yes to solar and wind. Uh, we, we have got to, we've got to try to catalyze it and then eventually let the market figure yeah. out what the best combinations are, but try to accelerate that process. A portfolio of solutions rather than just trying to pick one horse. Right. So um, you've, you've talked about the shifts in modeling and the improvements in modeling, the better forecast accuracies. Um, this is a data intensive world. 
is its progress gated by storage, by compute power, or by the underlying sort of analytical code that exists to process it? Or is it still a matter of learning the theoretical dynamics that you then have to put into code? Where, where do you see the advances and, and opportunities for exploitation? Well, I think it's a combination of just raw CPU power mm -hmm. and, and physical theoretical understanding. Um, okay. It's so essential. And I worry a little bit about the balance right now. We're putting a lot of money into computers, into AI, and fewer and fewer students are coming out of even places like MIT that really understand the physics. Mm -hmm. And there's a feeling maybe you don't need to, but I think history has almost always proved that to be a wrong idea. We need that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know, I'd like to see a lot more gifted students in physics and math come into climate science. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that the outside perception that it's highly politicized which it isn't inside the field of science, it's not very political at all. I can tell you that working in it, it's, it's very much like any other science, but the perception is it's all about politics and that's driving away some of the best and brightest. I wish I knew how to turn that around. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came in during the, the presentation asks about, are there chemical and physical processes that we know or think are significant um, impactors on, on, on temperature and climate change that are not well modeled at this point? Oh, yes, there are actually. I mean, the, I think people who study the global carbon cycle hmm. would be the first to admit that we don't understand it all that well. I mean, there's some elements of the cycle. It's, it's what we call biogeochemistry. It mm -hmm. includes, by a lot, obviously, a lot of biological processes, especially in the ocean, but also terrestrial Geological processes, chemical weathering of rocks takes CO2 mm -hmm. out of the atmosphere, for example. Uh, it's a really challenging and actually a wonderfully interesting field that a lot of people will be doing even if there were no consequences of burning fossil fuels for climate. It's just a very interesting problem. See, and that gives me a chance to introduce a, a question that came in from before the event. And that is, you know, we think about um, burning renewable sources, whether it's wood or, or grasses, wood pellets and so on. Should we really consider that a low carbon or no carbon source because the carbon ultimately gets recycled in the, in, in the environmental cycle? And if so, should we worry about the temperature excursions that might occur during the reabsorption process? And how long is that reabsorption process? That's an excellent question. And the length of the reabsorption process is a key element. So if you're doing anything that's in the long-term carbon neutral, you know, growing wood, uh, burning it, um, and putting a little bit underground because that's what happens in forests, right? Some of it gets buried, not much, but some of it has long-term burial. So mm -hmm. that you really are carbon neutral. It doesn't mean that you're carbon neutral on, say, a short time scale. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're burning a lot of wood and it, the, the growth isn't coming back at quite the rate uh, to compensate for that. So it, it's, a, it's a concern. I think the the only issue I have with carbon neutrality in that, and I, I don't really have an issue with it, of course, is it's not necessarily going to help us just because it's hard to scale it, meet the growing demand from the developing countries. And I personally feel that alleviating the horrific poverty in these parts of the world is at least as important. Mm -hmm. And it's also important from the point of view of climate, because as I mentioned in my talk, population increase is a big driver of emissions increase. And to reduce population increase, empirically, you need to increase per capita wealth. I think you must see the questions that are circling here, because that this is a wonderful jumping off point for two, one that came in before and one that just came in. One of the things we're seeing is, is some nonlinear effects um, as climate warms. Uh, we're starting to see increased methane emissions from uh, steps that have been frozen that are now thawing from peat bogs and so on. Um, how do we think about managing, is there a way to manage or reduce the impact of those emissions short of just going and refreezing everything? Is there some way to, to deal with that emitted methane? It's very, very hard to do that. Um, but the question is important 
because of the mention of nonlinearity and the fact that when we look at in detail at ice core records and deep sea sediment records, mm -hmm. we see that the climate is capable of flipping very fast for reasons we don't really understand. And whenever you see something like that, it's a, it's a potentially large risk, we don't understand it. There's good reason to be frightened of it. And we don't work that into any of the calculations of risk I presented. Okay, it's it's all assuming yeah. things are changing gracefully, right. uh, but the climate demonstrably has done these kinds of tipping points in the past, and so we can't rule them out. And it should be factored into uh, what we consider to be uh, risk. Um, I'm going to jump on a hand grenade. You had thrown a little hook out there in the in your presentation about. We had a hurricane drought back in the 80s, or was it the 60s to 80s? The 60s, there 70s, a, and 80s mostly, yeah. Is there a simple, quick answer to what drove that? Yeah, yeah. I, I would make it as simple as possible. European sulfur emissions from mostly fossil fuel combustion, they result in an aerosol, uh, sulfate aerosol, which we see as a haze, highly reflective. It was it brought down, as is always the case in that part of the world, around the Azores high in the summer, out over the Sahara, reduced sunlight, shut down the African monsoon. That was very well documented. Got lots of sand and dust blowing out over the Atlantic that cooled the Atlantic yeah. and caused the drought. <laughs> That's it. as simple as I can make yeah, it with the dominoes effect. We, we live in a lot of a system. <laughs> so it was a man-made drought, and it ended when we passed the Clean Air Acts, uh, which, you know, please don't misconstrue that as a as opposing those acts, yeah. but it was a black lining on a silver yeah. cloud. So we a lot of the world lives within 20 or 30 miles of the coastlines. Um, how should we think about uh, managed retreat versus defending coastlines? How do we think about it pragmatically? How do we think about it from a perspective of social justice? We've touched on the topic of tremendous poverty in much of the world. It's really, really important question. And the answer will undoubtedly be different from one location to the next. In some sense, all climate change is local uh, to pick up on Tip O'Neill. But um, so the, th the one thing, the sort of no brainer that we should start doing is stop subsidizing risk. That is, stop actively paying people to move to risky places, which happens massively in this country. It operates through the provision of federal flood insurance at very low premiums, mm -hmm. uh, it capping insurance premiums, which are never going to be an issue for a, a poor person, but affect the wealthy. The wealthy convince politicians to cap insurance premiums which allows them to build great big flimsy structures on the coastline. There's some no brainers. There's low hanging fruit. Just stop doing that. Mm -hmm. But the rest yeah. of it's hard. I mean, you can uh, just by making it too costly, uh, people of means can move themselves away. But if you're very poor and you know you rely on heavily on the community, and someone says to move. Uh, what are you going to do? Um, so it's a very, very nasty, thorny, but important set of issues. And we talk all night about that. Yeah, yeah the really politics of it are, yeah. are, are complicated beyond words. Um, we have a sort of a notion of a disaster loop. We have you know, extreme precipitation events or we have droughts. Um, that seems to trigger wildfires. Um, this, Those wildfires in many cases are triggered by man-made electrical systems. This is all happening in the context of a world that's trying to increasingly electrify. How should we think about approaching that? Can we break that disaster site, that negative uh, disaster circle um, as we tr continue to try and electrify? What would the solution be? Oh boy, uh, it's a tough one. I mean, I'm all for electrification because it's a step, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, it's very hard to decarbonize, you know, high temperature sources, uh, for example. It's not impossible, but it's very, very hard. So electrifying is a very important step. But of course, the more electrical lines you have around, the more susceptible they are to natural hazards, which are getting worse. That includes fires. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. I don't know. I here's what I know, uh, and it's from my own experience. Is I spend a lot of time in rural France. In rural France, they have buried most of the uh, utility lines, and the payback times ten years, roughly. And it's in ten years you've sort of paid yourself back. Ten years is okay for that particular culture and that particular socioeconomic system. It used to be okay in the United States, and it isn't anymore. It's one year. Okay, that's why the utilities, as far as I can tell, aren't burying lines. Mm -hmm. We should be doing that massively, and we should be doing that even if the climate weren't changing. Um, I, I don't know if most of the civilized world's doing that. Why it doesn't happen here? That's a market failure, probably. But we can sitting here in California, I would agree with you. <laughs> um, in talking about the storm damage, you know, you show the very interesting curves of, um, you know, the cost of the extreme events and the increasing portion of the frequent of the probability distribution that's exposed to those higher costs. If we think about segmenting those costs into wind damage versus water surge, flood damage. Is there a, a way to think about how those two are split? Which is the more significant of the two? And water will, by far. Water yeah, by that far. That is okay. an easy answer. It's almost all water. It's an interesting oh, yeah. misconception about hurricanes. Yeah, they produce very violent winds and they can be very destructive, but almost all the, the loss of life and the destruction is from water, which includes uh, you know, the torrent flooding caused by torrential rain and the storm surge, which is a big deal. So last question here before we just sort of wrap up, um, and I, I will uh, beg the pardon of the uh, guest that had submitted it because I've sort of paraphrased it, but we have COVID, we have nuclear threats, we have climate crises, financial crises, nationalism breaking out. Um, these things all consume everyone's attention in the context of all these sort of near term, potentially existential problems. What do we solve first? You know, can we, you know, we're going to have our time consumed dealing with COVID or dealing with a, you know, a nuclear problem with um, uh, some countries um, here in the world. Um, yet at the same time, the slow pot is constantly getting warmer and warmer and warmer. How do we balance our attention between these near term crises and the longer term crisis? Well, I, I'm optimistic this way because I think as a nation and as a people in the past, and I think currently in the future, we have been able to deal with multiple problems at the same time. It's a bit like asking, gee, we have problems with people dying of heart attacks and we have problems with people dying of cancer. Which do you want to prioritize? Uh, you know, it, it's a subjective question, but we don't have to choose. We might choose the we'll waiting. Right. We should do them all, and it's a question of weights. And yeah, I think we're yeah. we're a great country still. I I hope we can we can yeah. tackle a lot of these problems. Touch wood. So anyway, yeah, this wood. has been a <laughs> terrific evening. Thank you very very much. I'd like to bring Doug back on uh, to make some closing remarks. And thank you so much for your your time and your uh, thoughts and perspective. And to our audience's excellent questions. Thank you all. Yeah, that was really great, Carrie. Thank you. It's great to have you back eight years later uh, with a very different set of messages and everything, but very relevant to our concerns today. And I know I learned a lot about this tonight. And uh, you just give a different slant on things, which I really enjoy. So thank you, both of you, actually. Carrie, great presentation. So many good insights. Michael, Thank you for an outstanding job of moderating and, and asking the right questions and working through with Carrie. Um, I just think tonight was just a wonderful experience and it, it was really great to be part of all of that. And but we aren't finished yet. So here's our next event that we wanna forecast and that is um, December 6th. It's going to be the president and CEO of ChargePoint, Pat Romano. And, um, you know, I mean, it's easy to talk about electric vehicles and make a big deal about, you know, their growth and all that sort of stuff. But what we want to do is look at, you know, what might go wrong with this whole transition? Or another way to look at this too is what could we do to accelerate it if we are confident that it's a very important transition to drive, which 
I believe it is. Um, and so Pat, because he is so involved in the, the whole EV area, he's going to be able to discuss with us a lot of the things he sees going on around it, not just with charging stations, but with all kinds of other aspects that either accelerate or slow down the transition. So that is on Tuesday, December 6th, same time as our usual events. And we hope that many of you who are viewed, uh, viewed tonight's event will also attend that one. Uh, with that, thank you again very much, um, Carrie and Michael. And um, well, have a good holiday season. And we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you very much. And to all the audience, I tried to get to all your questions. They were all terrific. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't get them all out. So, so you thank did you all very much. Good job. So thank you, Michael. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Good night, Bye -bye. everybody. Good night. Good night.